Hello, and welcome to Russ's Movie Corner. And as you can see, I'm wearing my Armor of God t-shirt today. Which means, and I'm surrounded by a gigantic video. And what this means is that we're going to try a new style of rebuttal. Before, I was using OBS Studio, and in OBS I was able to like have a little window that would sit like right up here or right up here and I could kind of point to it and I could kind of you know and I could have that picture right there for you but for some odd reason OBS studio will not allow me because I don't have internet at my place um, I I don't have the ability to you know like s stream YouTube okay and it won't allow me to interact so if I just play a video the video will just play continuously in the window it doesn't stop it doesn't allow me to interact like it does so like when I open up the browser menu I can like open up a separate window and then I could set my mouse on my on my uh, on my knee and then I could just use that to then just kind of go in and you know control the video and it doesn't allow me to do that with a normal video I don't know why it's like OBS decided hey we'll let you have interactivity with the web browsers but videos no nah, we're not gonna let you have that which is why for the previous um, professor Dave rebuttal video that I did um, I decided that I was going to um, use OBS and I was just going to use the pictures in the corner um, because then I could just point to those pictures and I could say see here there you go now um, this here is Simon Dan okay Simon Dan came to my attention oh gosh I want to say it was 2018 um, I had started to hear this phenomena called um, the uh, flat earth um, or flurfers. I don't know if you guys have heard of flat earth before but there are people out there that still believe that we live on a pizza don't know why um, because us Christians we're not against science this is one of the things that you'll hear a lot out of people like Simon Dan is uh, those those religious extremists those Christians over there they they don't like science well no we've never said we didn't like science what we said was we don't like junk science okay we also don't like it when you lie okay like you do about evolution and we'll talk about that a little bit as we get further and further on into this video but the biggest thing I think that the biggest takeaway that I can come from from this kind of a thing was is when he would do a flat earth debunk of somebody who was a Christian who was professing that the Bible says which it doesn't that the earth is flat um, I he wanted to form a coalition um, a little while back and I don't think this coalition ever came about because once he mentioned it um, I had sent him a couple of messages about it um, but he had he had said that he wanted to get guys like uh, baldy cats and um, or conspiracy cats he wanted to get like a couple of the other guys doing flat earth debunk videos and kind of form like a coalition online to kind of like seek out and like respond to these flat earth videos um, and I wrote him a message and said look why don't why don't you and conspiracy cats and some of the other guys take just the ones doing the science experiments to try to prove the flat earth because that's your guys's realm I'll take the ones using the Bible since I'm a Christian I know the Bible better than you and I know what the Bible actually says better than you guys I never got a response back from him okay now I know that's a completely anecdotal story and I'm not holding that against him but when he does do debunk videos of people that talk about the Bible and try to relate it to flat earth he has a very very disdainful attitude well oh gosh about a year ago I think it is now because it was yeah it was probably during like right like right before the pandemic's like late 2019 early 2020 I started seeing um Simon Dan here popping up on some videos of um Kent Hovind and being that I was kind of a fan of Kent Hovind I would kind of watch some of those videos and I would laugh because it's like Simon Dan doesn't actually answer anything with science 
which is funny because I'd like to read something from his YouTube page, specifically from the channel that this video is from. Um, so let me jump into my history here. Let me scroll down. I've been watching a few videos here and there. Come on now. I know you're in there. I've had this video on my phone for a couple of days. There it is. Alrighty. Um. So basically, if I pop down his little description page, okay, maybe that was a little bit, there we go. I'll try it like that. Okay, it says, oh dear, oh dear, dear, oh dear, oh dear, Kent Hovind is back and this time presents us with a calamitous presentation filled with some awful science. You have to witness this one to believe it. And then he links back to Kent Hovind's original video. And his whole premise is, is that Ken Hovind not only does some debunk and rebuttal videos, but Ken Hovind also does some videos based upon, like, his theory and what he believes happened um, in terms of creation, what the early Earth was like, those kind of things. Okay? And then it says down at the bottom, and I'm not making this up, Dan's opinions shared in this video are supported by verified facts, whether scientific or general, and they should be treated as just that opinions. All critique and humor are addressed to the words and actions of individuals and are not the individuals themselves under the act of free speech. Basically, that's just a bunch of gibberish to say he really doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, when I say he really doesn't know what he's talking about, I mean he really doesn't know what he's talking about. In this video, Kent Hovind talks about how giants lived on the earth. People that were bigger than the normal human beings that God had created. And we'll get into this, okay? Because it's important to talk about this. And what's going to happen is, is that for this first video, and then this is going to be split into two parts, because I'm going to go about nine minutes, I'm going to go about halfway in the video, and I know that I skipped forward about two minutes in this video already, only because... His first, like, opening, like, couple of seconds, he just kind of, like, you know, Kent Hovind spends a bunch of time whacking me. Oh, get your minds out of the gutter. It's not even funny, okay? And then he spends about 30, he spends about a minute and a half promoting Skillshare. And it's kind of funny because as I was watching this video, I'm like, you definitely need to use that. Not for what you think you need to use it for, like he wants to learn it like he was learning about photography and he didn't know what focal length meant um like you're filming yourself and you didn't know what focal length meant wow um i've been filming myself for a while now and even i knew what focal length was i took a couple of photography classes in high school and i've helped some people with some photography classes so the thing is I'm just kind of face palming because it's like, okay, you know. But I think maybe he should have probably taken some courses in evolution because he really doesn't know what he's talking about. He probably also needs a few courses in science because, again, really doesn't know what he's talking about here. So we're going to jump in and we're going to kind of debunk some of this stuff that he's talking about here. Okay, so this is going to take a little bit of time. And I know I've probably talked for a few minutes already um, because I wanted to kind of set up how I know this guy um, and some of the videos that I've seen on his channel. Um, and a lot of his, um, like, Flat Earth Friday videos are very fun to watch. Um, I would recommend even just if you go and watch some of his original Flat Earth videos and some of the Flat Earth Friday videos, they're very fun to watch because a lot of those people have no idea what they're talking about. So we're going to jump into this. And like I said, when we get to around about 9 minutes and 20 seconds in the video, I'm going to end it. And then I'll do the second part of the video where we'll actually start to get more into the actual giants. And we'll actually talk a little bit more. Because Kent Hovind is a rambler. And I will say this. Kent Hovind is a rambler. He tends to kind of, 
you know, he talks about something and then he kind of goes in a roundabout way to get to his point. So he doesn't always like, he doesn't always like say what, what's going on and then immediately talk about that. He tends to kind of like talk about it and then give you like a big background on it and then go to the point that he wants to make. Okay. So he'll get to that point and that'll be in the second half of the video. We'll get to that point, but we have to kind of go through Kent Hovind's history lesson before we get to that point. So without any further ado, let's start the video. Kevin wants to tell us all about giants. This should be golden. We're going to skip up now and talk about, the Bible says clearly there were giants in the earth in those days. Genesis chapter 6. This is just before the flood started. God's going to tell Noah to build a boat. But it says there were giants in the earth in those days. What is this about? Okay, so I wanted to stop it right here <laughs> because this is going to become important now first off pull out my handy dandy bible <clears throat> we're going to look at genesis chapter six um and he was talking about um genesis uh chapter six verse four i'll get to verse four but what we're going to do is i'm going to go back up to genesis chapter six verse one says the origin of the giants it says presently when men began to grow numerous over the earth and had daughters born to them the sons of the gods noticed that the daughters of men were attractive so they married those whom they liked best then the lord said my spirit must not remain in man forever inasmuch as he is in flesh or he is flesh accordingly his lifetime shall be 120 years in those days, as well afterward, there were giants on the earth who were born to the sons of the gods whenever they had intercourse with the daughters of men. These were the heroes who were men who were men of note in days of old. So what Kent Hovind is saying here is is that you had these giants and you had another thing and this is something that i'm not sure what the king james version says but this is the revised standard version and basically the revised standard version says when men began to multiply on the face of the ground and the daughters and daughters were born to them the sons of god saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took to wife such as them as they chose then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, but his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. So it talks in there about the Nephilim, and it talks in there about the sons of God. What possible meaning could that hold? Well, if we think about it, the sons of God or the sons of the gods could be the fallen angels, also known as the Nephilim. Okay? They were known to be kind of gigantic. And we also know that when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, that they also went um, went to um, the that there was an that there was an angel that the Lord placed there with a flaming sword. Okay, that would kill anyone that got close to the garden, right? Because God was like, "Look, we have this tree in here that if they eat of it, they will be like us, like gods, like us, immortal, and we don't want them to do that." Okay, because they've already eaten from the knowledge of good and evil, and sin has entered, and we don't want that. So he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, and then he placed an angel at the entrance to the garden with a flaming sword. Okay, um, and I can, you know, look that up here really quick too. But that was basically, um, here it is. Um, this is 322, um, Genesis 322. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord sent 
him forth, the man and the woman, from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim with it, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So basically that's saying, you know, here's here's that, you know, God made the earth, God made man, you know, made everything, Genesis chapter 1, and then chapter 2 kind of talks about kind of a, a summation of him creating the earth, and then talks about how, you know, he was like, hmm, let's, let us make man in our own image. So he made man, and then he breathed the life into him, raised him up, and then he said, hmm, it is not good for man to be alone. Let's make a companion for him. So then they brought animals to him, and he named them, and then he sent them away, and he goes, hmm, couldn't find a suitable helper for him. Ah, I got it. And then knocks him out, takes a rib, okay, floating ribs down here, takes one of those floating ribs, sticks it, you know, and forms the woman out of him, out of, out of the man's rib, okay? And then when the man wakes up, he sees the woman, and he's like, whoa, you are flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood. You shall be called woman. Okay? Because Adam is literally the man, and, like, woman is literally just the female version of that. That's it. That's the only difference. Um, and anyway, so he had... So they were there, man and woman. They were naked, and they knew no shame, and that's kind of how chapter 2 ends. Chapter 3 comes in, and then that's where chapter 3 goes. Okay? So... Here's the funniest thing. Um, so now that we kind of know where we were in chapter 6. So you've had Cain and Abel. You had some other things happen. You know, Cain went off, da-da-da-da-da. They had, they had some sons. They had some different things happen. We get to chapter 6, and it talks about these giants, okay, which were the sons, which were the offspring of the sons of God, or the sons of the gods, the Nephilim, and the daughters of men. So basically, you had these angels that were either living on earth in some way, or they had been cast out of heaven by God. Sometime around the same time as Satan being cast out of heaven. It's one of the reasons why Satan went into the garden and corrupted the man, because he, you know, corrupted man and woman, because he knew that God had created them. And, um, and so you had all of these men having daughters, and then you had, like, these angels basically coming over and saying, hmm, I like your daughter there. I'm going to marry her. And then, you know, they would take her, and then they would have half-angel, half-men babies. Okay? Now, <laughs> the other part of this that I wanted to stop it right here is this is something that Kent Hovind says a lot um, when he starts his videos. He goes, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So what he's basically saying is is that what Peter is saying here in this in this section, and we'll come actually full circle back to Second Peter 3 here in a minute, um, is that, you know, scoffers walking after their own lusts. What is Dan going to immediately do right after this? Oh, that's right. He's going to scoff at the Bible. <laughs> it, it, it's literally ironic. It is so funny. What, just listen. Just listen. The giants. Hmm, yes, I'd like to know myself about this as well. And some evidence would be good, please. It looks like this is going to link with the Bible's version of creation. Let's continue. God said... Yeah. So, he says, Oh yes, and I would like some evidence, please. Oh, you would like some evidence, please? Well, Jay, we've been asking for evidence of evolution for years. Where's your evolution evidence? I mean... <sighs> this is the height of hypocrisy. Right here, right now, you are seeing it out of the mouth of the evolutionists. Oh, 
You're going to prove the giants walked the earth. Oh, well, then I'd like some evidence, please. I'd like some evidence that stromatolites existed. That single-celled bacterium that you say created was created out of the primordial soup, either in the ocean or in some goo somewhere. How did that suddenly grow chloroplasts and start making its own food? And then all of a sudden, and as if by magic, it makes its own food. And if that was so evolutionarily advantageous for it to make its own damn food, why isn't it still making its own damn food today? Why does the bacteria have to eat on me and you and every other human in this world and every other animal and every other living thing? Why would a bacteria do that? Answer me that. If it was so evolutionarily advantageous for these single-celled bacterium to get together and grow their own chloroplasts, as if by magic, and band together, as if by magic, to create these colonies of things called stromatolites, prove that those existed. 2011, Nat Geo, The Story of Earth. It was written by two PhDs. I'm not making this up. It's literally what they said. And as if by magic. They say it like two or three times in that whole thing. And as if by magic. And as if by magic. And as if by magic. Come on. Where's your evidence that macroevolution ever happened? Come on, man. Seriously. <sighs> okay. So, um, right here... Um, Kent is going to kind of talk um, about his uh, Hoven theory, okay? Um, so, Kent Hoven came up with a theory of how he thinks God formed the earth. And it's based upon this part in Genesis chapter 1, where he says right here in verse 6 and 7, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters and so basically what he was saying was is if you look at the creation let me see here where to put my bible if you look here at the creation story and we'll go back here to genesis chapter one really fast um because it's kind of important to kind of talk about this because as we get into this uh this is where simon dan's argument will start to fall apart so, says so 6 and 7, says, um, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the middle of the waters, and divide the waters in two. And so it was. And God made the firmament, dividing the waters that were below the firmament from those that were above it. And God called the firmament sky. Evening came, morning the second day. So on the second day, okay, so on the first day, God said, Let there be light, right? The first, first day, okay, God was hovering Okay, it says, When God began to create the heaven and the earth, the earth was a desolate waste with darkness covering the abyss and a tempestuous wind raging over the surface of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came and morning the first day. Okay? So then the second day, God says, Let there be a firmament. The firmament is the air. And it's right here in verse 8. It says and God called the firmament sky. Sky. What do we what do we see is the sky? Oh right, the air. What is the sky? It's the refraction. What we see as the sky is the refraction of blue visible light spectrum off of the atmosphere itself. So what is the sky? It's the air. It's where the birds fly. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. Now, what he's saying is is that the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. So what he's going to talk about here is that he believes that in the hydroplate theory, there's there's a there's a guy out there, and I can't remember his name right off, right off the bat, but he, he believes in this thing called the hydroplate theory. Okay? And basically what he thinks is, is that under the crust of the earth, okay, so like the earth sits here, there were channels under the earth okay, that held water. And because in the story of Noah, it says the waters burst forth from the ground like a geyser, okay? And <clears throat> Kent Hovind's theory is that the pre-flood world, so basically the world that God created from the creation 
to the flood was completely different than what the post-flood world is today. Okay, and the problem is is that people like Simon Dan don't understand the concept that he's trying to put forth. They have kind of like closed off their mind to this concept, and so while he sits here and talks about this kind of stuff, he's going to come up with some different ideas and some different things. Some of this I subscribe to, some of it I don't, but just know that this is what Hoven's theory is, okay? And we're going to keep going because there's one small part here in a second that I will talk about because it will become important. Let me just let Kent kind of talk about his theory here. But in Genesis 1, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And so there was water under the firmament and water above the firmament. You find in verse 20 that the firmament is where the birds fly. That's obviously the air. So there used to be a layer of water or ice above the atmosphere. We covered that in the last night. Okay. Again, I'm going to pause here. This is very, very, very important right now. I want you to look at this image right above my head. Okay? I believe there was a crystalline canopy of super cold ice about 10 miles above the Earth that made the pre-flood world very different. Ice. Keep that in mind. Okay? This is, this is the key to his theory is that there was... He says, just a couple of, of fingers thick, okay, just a small shell of ice that acted like a greenhouse, okay, trapped a lot of air, it kept plants, and because there was a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere, things could grow bigger. That's part of his theory. I want to make this clear. Look at this picture. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. What's this? Let's go back to that slide for a second. A crystalline canopy of super cold ice. What? Yes. A layer of ice. He says ice, not vapor. Ice. Keep this in mind. Okay? Come on, Ken. Surely not. For the last couple of nights, I'm a strong believer in the, what's called the canopy theory. Okay. So now, this, this picture right here, okay? is a little bit different because this one this canopy is talking about just water vapor okay so it was like a super thick mist of vapor water vapor around the earth okay that was blocking a lot of that stuff now kent has written right above i think it's right above here okay probably not ice or probably ice not vapor that's important Okay. This, of course, is total nonsense. There are so many holes in this theory that I'll be still sat here come Easter time. Really? Holes? Such as? Ugh. You see what they do here? Okay. You see what they're doing here? Ugh. I have been dealing this. Dealing with this since 2017 okay and i'll explain why in a second look people if you are not going to debunk anything then don't make these types of videos if you're not going to spend the time to try to poke the holes in the theory okay like maybe hmm i don't know that you know, with the gravity and the, the this and the that and da 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 da, it might not hold together. It might not coalesce. Blah blah blah. You have to come up with some kind of a theory to explain why this particular theory doesn't work. Otherwise, you're just spitballing it. Okay? Star Wars fans do this all the fucking time, and it pisses me off. They always say this. I hate TLJ, but I won't list anything because it's too numerous to count. That means you don't have any gripes. I hate this. <sighs> this isn't debunking anything. This is just him saying, well, I don't think it works this way. So you know what? I, I could be here all day explaining it, but you know what? I I'm just too good for that. That's all he's saying. He's not debunking anything. This is straight up lying. Okay? 
because they can't show you if it isn't true or if it is true. Okay? Just like macroevolution, they can't prove that it did happen or it didn't happen, so they just hand wave it away. That's what he's doing here. Oh, there's so many holes in this theory. I could be here till Easter. Really? Then why don't you list two or three of them? You don't have to talk about every single one of them. Hell, I took the time to do... Somebody had printed out a list of like 20 things that they thought were plot holes in The Last Jedi. Okay? And they posted them on some stupid video talking about how much The Last Jedi sucked. I went through all of them with the lore of Star Wars using these two books, the novels I've mentioned numerous times before, like Before the Awakening and all those different sources. I went through every single point and I busted every single one of them. And a person came back and said, well, that doesn't work. And I said, then prove me wrong. If you're just going to stand there and say it doesn't work, that means you don't have an argument. You're just trying to hand wave it away. And you don't know. That's the problem. Simon Dan doesn't know this. He doesn't know this. So he's literally lying to his viewers by saying, oh, well, you know, there's so many holes in this theory that I'd be here until this, until Easter. Here I am, doing a debunk video. It's not even Easter yet. Come on, man. Come on. Either, if you're going to do these, you either talk about the subject at hand, or you just say, you know, hey, I'll address this point on a different video because this would be a video in and of itself. That's different. Okay? Because I've actually done that. I've actually devoted whole videos to one segment of a, of a thing. For instance, my, um, my Professor Dave debunk that I, just, that I just posted up. Okay? I actually filmed it last year, but I just now posted it up because I finally got it, finally got the videos put into, you know, my editing software. I finally got some things put on, and I was able to get them printed, and I was able to get them out there. Okay? But when I filmed that back in 2020, okay... I didn't, I, I was actually going to do it how I normally did it, which was I was going to kind of, you know, let him speak for a few minutes and then dut, and then let him speak for a few minutes and then dut, and then when I found out that I couldn't do that, I just kind of like, I took pictures with my phone on my phone screen, I cut them, I edited them down to just the words in the page, and then I put them up there on the video so that I could say, you know, this is what's going on. I'm not saying, oh, they're too numerous to count, so I'm not going to debunk this. No, I went, these are their own videos. I talked for 16 minutes just on Ken Hovind, okay? And how wrong Dave Farina was about him, okay? I talked for 40 minutes, <laughs> okay, on just the Bible verses that he was wrong about. So if you're going to do a video like this, either address it or just say you'll do it later, whether or not you actually do it later, okay? But don't do this. It is lazy. Ugh. All right. This is the world that then was being overflowed with water perry. That original world from the creation up until the flood but people live to be 900. Come on, Kent. Now, I respect your right to believe in this book, but 900 years old? That, that world... Okay. So... The, uh, the second Peter verse that, um, that Kent is talking about here, I'm going to start reading from verse 1 of chapter, uh, of, uh, chapter 3 of Second Peter says, um, this is the second letter, dear friends, that I have now written to you in the effort to arouse your unsullied minds to remember the things foretold by the holy prophets and the commands of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. 
First of all, you must understand this, that in the last days mockers will come with their mockeries, going where their passions lead, and saying, Where is his promised coming? For ever since our forefathers fell asleep, everything has remained as it was from the beginning of creation. For they, willing, they willfully ignore the fact that long ago there existed heavens and an earth, which had been formed at God's command out of water and by water, by which also that world was destroyed through being flooded with water. Now verse 7, But by the same command, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire and are kept for the day when the godless men are to be judged and destroyed. That's what that whole passage is talking about there. Okay, I like to put things in context. Sometimes Kent Hovind likes to put up his verses because you know he, he knows exactly what he's talking about. So for those of you that may not be familiar with Kent or may not be familiar with some of those things, yes, that is how it is. Now, here's the thing. Um, and, and I'll get... Um, actually, here, let me just... Let me let this go by... I'll let Kent speak here, and then I'll let um, then I'll let him speak, and then and then I'll pause it for a second. They really did like, live over 900 years, but that world was overflowed with water and perished. They really did live for over 900 years. Any evidence for that, Kent? Sure. <sighs> Do you see the hypocrisy here? He hasn't provided a single shred of evidence yet. None. None whatsoever. Okay? And yet, he's demanding evidence from us. Okay. You want evidence? Huh? Simon did? You want your evidence? Here's your evidence. Oh. It's more than your side hails, buddy. Yeah. You know, things like your Dead Sea Scrolls, the archaeological evidence that's out there? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> what do you have? Lucy? A bonobo ape skeleton? The geologic column? Hmm? Come on, man. Yeah. You can't date a rock. Then the rock doesn't have a tag. Bam! Stamped. This was made 65 million years ago. It's not how it works, dude. Okay? And you have no proof that the fossils in those layers come from that. Okay? Come from that time period. Because your dating methods. This is, this is literally how they date things. Okay? They, they go, okay, this rock layer is supposed to be, let's say, 75 million years old. So they date a fossil using carbon dating, using argon potassium dating, something like that, okay? And they'll 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 test like five or six different you know, places on the on the fossil. And they'll get five or six different numbers. And what they'll do is is they'll look for the number that is closest to the date that they think that layer should be, and then they pick all the rest up and they throw them out. I have a lot more evidence than you do, buddy. Way more evidence. So don't sit there and think that you're above reproach. Okay? <clears throat> so. In chapter 5. It says, the following is the list of Adam's descendants. When God created man, it was in both the likeness of God that, that he made him. Both male and female he created, and he blessed them. And at the time of their creation, he called them man. After living 130 years, Adam had a child born in him in his own likeness, resembling himself, and he called his name Seth. Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth and was the father of other sons and daughters. Thus Adam lived altogether 930 years. Then he died. That's my proof. And if you don't like it, you can go to the Museum of the Bible, and you can look 
at the actual Dead Sea Scrolls that prove that this is that this was written down a long time before you were ever on the earth there, buddy. A long time before your science ever discovered anything about the earth. Okay? And our science was proving that the earth was round. And our science was creating things. Because like I said, religion and science are not incompatible. You can't have one without the other. Because if there is a creator God and he created this universe that we are, this four-dimensional universe that we are living in right now, he would have had to have created the fundamental laws of science that we are discovering today. And that's why I'm saying I have a lot more evidence than you do, buddy. Because the numbers are not on your side. This has been the most proven book in the world because every time people like you try to debunk it, people have gone out and on missions to try to debunk this book and not only have they found that it's real, but they have found that it's actually accurate. Okay? And I'm not going to say, well, I could list numerous sources. I'll put a couple of links down in my comments section or down in my description section, okay, of things, of archaeology you know, archaeology that, that proves that the stories in the Bible are true. Okay? And so, if one story in the Bible is true, and Timothy and, and Paul to the Apostle Timothy writes, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, then that means all of it's true, buddy. So, yes... Adam really did live 930 years. It's right there. Right there for you to read, even though you don't want to. <clears throat> the flood of Noah explains many things. We covered this yesterday. It explains why there are legends of a golden age. It explains where dinosaurs fit in, how Grand Canyon formed, etc., etc. We went through 13 or 17 things that the flood formed. Now it also, uh, oh, should be number 18. I got the wrong number on this next one. Disregard this. I put 13. There were giants in the earth in those days. Giant men, giant plants, giant animals, giant insects. Now, I don't want to jump the gun here, so I'd like to get some context in terms of how giant he really means here. There is evidence of larger insects in the Earth's history when oxygen levels were higher in the atmosphere. And, of course, we had mammoths and things like that. Does he mean things like that, or is he talking mile-high people? What? mile-high people? He never said anything about mile-high people. How giant do you think a giant is? Hell, I think in D&D, &D, giants are only like 20 to 30 feet tall. That's not a mile high. Hell, even some of the most, some of the largest dragons in like Dragonlance and, you know, like some of those kind of things in Dungeons and Dragons are only four to 500 feet tall, you know, from snout to, you know, basically from snout to the base of their tail and then their tail might be another 100 feet long or 200 feet long or something like that okay i mean hell i just got done reading the dragonlance fifth age okay and i happen to know a lot about sizes in dungeons and dragons and giants what we would term as giants are only about 20 to 30 feet tall okay they're huge but they're not a mile high i don't know what the fuck he's talking about here um but you notice how he's exaggerating it, right? He's like, so what is it, mile high people? He's exaggerating it to make it seem ridiculous, okay? Because Ken Hovind is saying giants, and he's like, oh yeah, so what are they, a mile high? Like, where did that come from? But he's trying to do that to make Kent, his point, seem ridiculous. The part I don't get is that he's actually agreeing with Kent when he says that there was higher O2 content on the Earth. Um, and how do we know this? Ice cores! Yay! We drill down into the ice in Antarctica, okay? And we pull out these big, gigantic, long... I mean, and we're talking, like, huge, because in, like, some places that... I mean, we're talking ice cores, you know, like... 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet long, okay? And then they put them in these in these tubes, and what they do is, is they pull them out, okay? And under lights and stuff, and then and then what they do is, is they'll, like, stick probes in, small little tiny probes in, um, 
and like hit trapped air pockets because as you know when snow falls when it when it traps it traps gases in the molecules and as that compresses down into ice those those little bubbles stay where they're at okay and they can actually you know like use a spectrometer to show how you know to test how much nitrogen oxygen that kind of stuff and yes we see in those cores we see that there is a higher o2 content but where we differ is on the time frames okay because dan will tell you that it was tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of years ago okay but it doesn't take tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years to create multiple layers of ice in one year okay or even in a period of years like two like 10 years 20 years something like that they could have um you know a period of 10 years where they have just snow layer upon snow layer upon snow layer upon snow layer upon snow layer and then other years they may just have like one just you know they may just have like a couple of big storms and then it just kind of compacts down into one so they almost count those like tree rings see this is this is you know 100 years ago this is 200 years ago this is 500 this is 10,000 this is 50 you can't do that because again they're throwing out certain numbers to try to get the rings to match where they want it to match okay because they're looking at the geologic column and they're trying to match the geologic column to the ice core column that doesn't work because the geologic column is wrong so their assumption is automatically wrong ergo when they try to match the ice core rings to the geologic column they're automatically assuming that everything is going the way it is okay and it's kind of like tree rings okay you can have multiple new tree rings created in the same in some years okay so you can get like because if you if you chop down a tree like you go to the center of it you see all those little concentric circles and in some of those concentric circles you will have like five or six new rings growing at once okay and that's not that's not like five good years of growth that might be one year of good growth okay because they've measured um they've taken core samples of trees okay all the way in and then the next year they take another core sample on a different side of the tree and they'll notice that there's like five or six new rings on it from the year before okay so again it's you know it's not true how it works so we're just you know yeah so we're just gonna go so now getting back to what we said before about the canopy of ice right ken hoven said there was a canopy of ice and he said around 10 miles above the earth okay that shielded the earth from a lot of these rays let's come on just remember that what was different before the flood well a layer of ice a couple inches thick would block out ultraviolet light there's a lot of harmful stuff comes off the sun besides just the sunlight how many ever got out in the sun and got a sunburn before, okay? The sun produces ultraviolet light, x-rays, gamma rays, all them ray boys come down here, they're pretty hard on your body, they'll tear it up, right? For once we agree, however, water vapor alone doesn't block UV. It has help from all the other gases in the atmosphere, chiefly being the ozone layer. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, did you hear what he just said? Hang on a second. Let me back this up just a teensy weensy bit, okay? It's all their ray boys come down here, and they're pretty hard on your body. They'll tear it up. Right? Let's hear this. For once, we agree. However, water vapor alone doesn't block UV. Water vapor? Man, come on, dude. You've got to do better than that. Ugh. Kent said ice. Not vapor. Ice. What's the difference between vapor and ice? Solid gas. Ugh. 
You know, when I did that Professor Dave rebuttal video, I had a guy come on, and uh, he came into my page, started yelling and screaming at me about how, you know, um, Kent was, you know, always doing something called a pivot and gish gallop, where he would come on, where somebody would talk to him, and then he would just, like, say, oh, no, and then he would, like, go off on a separate topic. Well, a gish gallop is defined as overwhelming your opponent by an excessive number of arguments without regard for accuracy or strength of those arguments. Okay? Now, Kent said a layer of ice earlier. Okay? We know this. He said a layer of ice. Now, granted, on one of the slides he showed, it said vapor. But Kent said probably ice, not vapor. Okay? Because he was talking about ice a couple of inches thick, okay, that would surround the earth and give it like a greenhouse effect. And I said, remember that, because we're going to come back to that. Here it is. I remember listening to this, and I'm like, Dan, he said ice, not vapor. And you accuse us of being the ones that pivot. We're not the ones pivoting. You are. <sighs> All right, let's finish up this one little thing again, and then we'll come back. It has helped from all the other gases in the atmosphere, chiefly being the ozone layer. Okay, stop. The ozone layer only filters out one harmful ray. On this graph, right above, pretty much right above my head, right here, okay? It says ultraviolet, 7%. Of the spectrum okay those are UV alpha and UV beta rays okay UVA UVB okay and this goes the ozone layer only filters out UVB rays okay now I'm going to let this play for a second, and then we'll come back to this. 44% of what the sun produces is visible light, and 49% is not visible. But it can still do damage. You're a nurse. You ever deal with this kind of stuff in the hospital? No? Okay. Seven things you may not know about x-rays. In water, the majority of soft x-ray photons will be absorbed before they've traveled even a millionth of a meter. Water absorbs x-rays. Interesting. Indeed, but hospital x-ray machines use hard x-rays, not soft ones. The difference between them, of course, is the energy that they carry. And the sun, yes, the sun emits hard x-rays too. So if there was a canopy of water above the earth, a couple inches thick, that would block out most of the x-rays from the sun. But Earth's atmosphere blocks x-rays anyway without a layer of water. I'm mean, had an x-ray before. Wait. Water vapor doesn't? Are you sure about that, Dan? Because I think science would beg to differ with you. From Humboldt College. This is introduction. This is their um, geospatial online. This is from their course GSP 216. Atmospheric absorption and transmission. The sun is the primary source of electromagnetic radiation on Earth. The Earth is constantly bombarded with electromagnetic radi radiation. But before the electromagnetic energy from the sun reaches the Earth's surface, it must pass through the atmosphere. The atmosphere protects us from exposure to higher energy radiation that can be harmful to life, i.e. X-rays and gamma rays. I'll get to back to that in a second. Okay? It says, as it passes through the atmosphere, it interacts with molecules and particles present in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, EMR is scattered or reflected, absorbed, and a portion of energy passes through to the atmosphere to reach the surface. So, if you go down below to absorption, a portion of incoming solar radiation is absorbed by gases in the Earth's atmosphere. 
These gases absorb electromagnetic energy at certain wavelengths. Therefore, in certain portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, very little energy is absorbed, for example, the visible, while in other portions, like the ultraviolet, nearly all incoming, nearly all incoming energy is absorbed. The portions of the spectrum that are absorbed by the atmospheric gases are known as, are known as absorption bands. The primary gases that are responsible for the majority of atmospheric absorption of energy are, wait for it, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone. Water vapor, H2O, very strong absorber in the 5.5 to 7.0 micrometer range and greater than 27 micro micrometers. Note that water vapor in the atmosphere is also variable in time and space. This means absorption rates may vary depending on the location and the time of the day and the year. Carbon dioxide, CO2, primarily absorbs radiation in the mid and far thermal infrared portions of the spectrum. Ozone, O3, strongly, absorbs strongly in the UV portion of the spectrum, very short wavelengths, and is responsible for protecting us from damaging radiation that causes skin cancer. Ooh. So, UV rays can still be harmful. And even if, if 100%, which is scientifically impossible, by the way, of the x-rays are being absorbed by the atmosphere, we still get exposed to harmful things like UVA, UVB, and infrared, which can still be harmful. Now, he just said that there was no layer of water in the atmosphere absorbing energy. So, okay. There is a layer of water. The water vapor in the air absorbs. That's why on a cloudy day, okay, you can go outside and you can walk around. People have gotten skin burnt on a cloudy day. Why? Because UVA and UVB rays can still make it through the clouds. Depending on the transparency and the thickness of the clouds, you can still get a sunburn on a cloudy day. Okay? Because the UVA and the UVB rays can still get you. Can still hit your skin. Okay? Now, I'm looking out my window right now. It is an absolutely beautiful sunny day. There is not a cloud in the sky. Okay? So yes, CO2 can still absorb some of those if, if thermal infrared rays, okay? And trace amounts of water can still absorb some of the x-rays, okay? Because, you know, it evaporates from the cars, from the lawns, you know, when the sprinklers rain, from the river, okay? There, might, there, there, there is still some evaporation, so there's trace amounts of water vapor in the air right now. It's just not enough to coalesce into a cloud. Okay, but it's also not enough that, I mean, it's not enough to matter, okay? Because if it's not enough to form into a cloud, then it's not enough to matter. It's trace amounts of water vapor, okay? But it won't block 100% of those harmful rays. It, nothing can block 100%. This is a misnomer in science, and this is what we like to call the assumption, okay? Because when they first calibrated these machines and they went, huh, we're not detecting any, you know, radiation. Okay. They use that as a calibration for all of their machines. Okay. So if the calibration was done, let's say on a very cloudy day, when there was a lot of water vapor in the air, maybe it was raining, maybe there was something else going on. So maybe it was blocking a lot of those x-rays. And so when they turned it on, they were like, oh, hey, there's not a lot of x-rays. Hey, you know, hey, cool. And then maybe they didn't test it again on a sunny day. We don't know that, okay? What I see is a chart that shows a line at 100%. And then as it gets towards the visible light spectrum, when it hits the, um, the 100 nanometer particle coming up to the 1 micrometer particle, it starts to dip down, okay? And then it goes into the visible light spectrum where it dips way down. And then it has a whole bunch of other ones with the... Um, you know, with the um, infrared and all that kind of stuff. And then it goes back down to radio waves, and then it goes up to the long wavelength, radio waves are blocked. So, <clears throat> again, it'll never block 100% of harmful rays, okay? And even this says, um, 
while other portions like the ultraviolet, nearly all incoming energy is absorbed. Nearly all. How much does that mean? 99%? 95%. And if those are coming through, they will do damage to your skin. I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. We played rough in our neighborhood. We did not know the meaning of the word stupid. Famous last words. Hey, y'all, watch this. How many ever did that before? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. You go to the hospital. They say, take off all your clothes and put this little gown on. And the little gown doesn't quite come together in the back. How many ever had to wear one of them before? It's kind of embarrassing. And they say, now walk down the hall about 12 miles. And on the left, there's an x-ray room. And when they get there, they say, would you please lay on this table? And they just got the table out of the freezer a few minutes before you got there. How many been on the same table? You know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> I've been on those cold tables before. And the doctor says, okay, take a deep breath and hold it. He says, now wait, wait, Doc. What are you going to do? He says, i got to x-ray you. Well, Doc, why do you have the lead vest on? And why are you running clear across the room or outside the room to push the button to x-ray me? Is this machine dangerous? He says, no, it's harmless. Oh, come on, Ken, you know the reason why. Having one x-ray is relatively harmless. Being in the same room, giving multiple x-rays a day, is not. Right. you got a lead vest. I'm running out behind a lead-plated wall, and I'm laying here nearly naked under this machine. <laughs> what's, what's, how does this thing work? He says, well, when I mash the button, x-ray bullets come out of that machine, and they're going to go right through your body, <laughs> like a machine gun, and we're going to make a shadow of what's inside, a reverse image. By the way, that's why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life, too, by the way. But Ken Hovind, ladies and gentlemen, available for after-dinner speaking at a bingo hall near you. You say, well, Doc, if this is hard... Does anybody know how condescending that sounds? I mean, does anybody... Do, am I the only one that hears it? Because that was extremely condescending. Like, he was above everybody. I mean, I know that the British have already kind of an arrogance about them, where they naturally, you know, because of the British Empire and because of a lot of their things, they naturally kind of have this haughtiness about them, but he just seems to have this really, really condescending attitude. And he's not the only one, because there was another guy that I, that I, that I was just talking about who was on my channel. I mean, he came on and spewed all this verbal diarrhea, and I'm like... I'm like, you're accusing me of judging someone, and yet you're judging me all the time. And you're condescending towards me. Like, you think you're above me. It's like, you don't know me. <laughs> but him, he sounds really condescending. And I don't know, maybe in life, maybe in real life, like if I were to actually meet the guy, maybe he's really nice. I don't know. But he sounds really condescending. Why do you run out behind the lead wall? He says, well, I'm afraid some of them x-ray bullets might bounce off and hit me accidentally. Accidentally, Doc, they're going to hit me on purpose. Oh, yeah, but you're only going to get one or two x rays. He said, I deal with this machine all day long. I don't want to get this all day every day. It's x rays, okay? And what was the point of this little monologue, Kent? See, the sun x rays us every day, except on cloudy days. Bingo. Except on cloudy days. Gee, what is a cloud again? Oh, I wonder. Oh! <gasps> Oh, that's right! Water vapor! Dumbass. This water stops. X-rays. Interesting. And your skin feels the full force of the X-rays. Your skin gets blasted by billions and billions of holes every day by the X-rays, and your body has to fix the problem. Simply not true. Earth's atmosphere blocks all of the X-ray radiation. But after Simply not true, it blocks nearly all again if the sun let's just say for example this is a for example okay thing and i'm not going to stand there and debate numbers but what i'm going to say is is that if you put a put a stake in the ground a meter squared let's say you could measure that amount of light that was coming down there let's say it was one trillions of one trillion of the sun's rays coming down into that one meter because you could easily stand in a box, you know, in a square that's a meter. That's three and a half, that's three, three feet, three inches, okay, on a side. You could stand there like this and in a meter, okay? 
Some people maybe not, but most people probably could. And let's say for the sake of argument that there were one trillion ray, rays, sun's rays, in that one meter squared space. One trillion rays. So what's one percent of a trillion? Because it says nearly all. What's one percent of a trillion? That's ten billion rays. What's point one percent is a billion and point zero one percent of a trillion is a hundred million x-ray bullets hitting your skin in a meter if there were a trillion rays hitting you now I don't know how many light rays there are I've never measured that. I don't know if science has ever quantified the amount of light photons and energy emitted by the sun on the face of the earth. But I would imagine it's probably north of a trillion. And so if I can go outside and 1% of a trillion, okay, is 100, is 10 billion that's a lot of x-ray bullets hitting me, you fucking moron. Get it through your head. That's a lot. Because even as you start to go down, you increase the number of rays, you increase the number of x-ray radiation getting through. Because even if you were to say, oh, well, there's only, you know, on average, over the course of, you know, I mean, because this is, we're talking, this is just if we had the sun shining down through just like a box, okay? One trillion of its rays through a box a meter squared and hitting a person full force. Okay? And then we blocked it out with certain things to where it's like, oh, well, only 99% is blocked, but that 1% that's coming through is still 10 billion. I would imagine that there's probably a lot, and in an, and in an eight to twelve hour day of sunlight, that's a lot of rays, because it's not like the sun just emits one light particle and goes, "Okay, I'm done for the day." No, it's emitting that much radiation all the time at the Earth, and the Earth is rotating around, and so in summertime when there's eight to twelve hours of sunlight per day okay in the northern latitudes I'm not talking about like way north um, like the north slope of Alaska or like up at the North Pole I'm talking about like the northern latitudes okay because that's when the Sun that's when the the earth is tilted towards the Sun okay and it's receiving the brunt okay it's about where I live okay I live in the northern part of the of the United States all right so that's a lot of x-ray bullets hitting your skin. Okay? And so you just said water vapor's fake. Or water vapor doesn't stop x-rays. Which is false. Water vapor does stop x-rays. You also just said Earth's atmosphere blocks all radiation, which is false. Okay? So it looks like Simon Dan here is wrong about science he's not thinking about the science itself okay so I had to really search through Google just to find this one article from Humboldt okay now the websites that he's quoting from just say harmful rays and it says blocks out all it's very vague okay it just says the Earth's atmosphere blocks out harmful rays. That's all it says. It doesn't, it's not specific on how much it does block versus how much it doesn't block. And like I said, I had to scour to get this article from Humboldt. Okay? And these websites are so vague to the point of just, it's ludicrous to think that this is what's passing as science and that this guy is going to sit here and tell me that 
I'm the dumb one, okay, because it says nearly all. Oh, well, then it's all. No, it's not. Because even that one-tenth of one percent is still a billion particles coming down to hit the earth. That's a lot, okay? And even though those some of those x-rays might hit some some oxygen molecules or some nitrogen molecules as it passes, doesn't mean that it's going to be completely diffracted. Doesn't mean that it's going to, to diffuse it, okay? Doesn't mean that it's going to skip it. Doesn't mean it's going to refract it. Doesn't mean it's going to do anything to it. Because you can't prove that that's what happens, okay? You can't. So we're going to finish up here, and then I'm going to call this episode, and then I'll kind of research and do the second episode, and then I'll get it up when I get it up. You're about 50 or 60 or 70 years, or 80 for sure. Everybody around you starts to notice you're losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. That's just old age skin. As you get older, the skin loses its elasticity and becomes thinner. That is what causes the wrinkles. You say, Brother Hogan, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Well, I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? Now, if you don't want to wrinkle, you can carry a lead or concrete umbrella over your head at all times. And it'll stop the x-ray. Dear, oh dear, Ken. And you taught science. I'm sorry, Simon Dan, and you thought you knew science. Oh. Why does skin elasticity change? Skin is the body's largest organ. It is also your shield against the elements. As people age, their skin naturally starts to show the effect of time. In addition to losing collagen, skin also starts to lose elastin, a protein which provides skin the ability to stretch and snap back. Elastin is found in the connective tissue of the skin's dermis layer. Environmental lifestyle causes can worsen and accelerate elastosis. They include sun exposure, air pollution, poor nutrition, smoking. Rapid, excessive weight loss can also cause elastosis. I'm sorry, what were you sciencing? Sun exposure. In fact, the number one cause of elastosis okay is exposure to sunlight exposure to sunlight so how exactly does the skin lose its elasticity again oh that's right being on the sun you can tell people who have been out in the sun without proper skin um, you know skin cream on you know like sunscreen okay they go out and they do stuff okay you take take two people somebody who protects their skin as they go outside and does things and a person who doesn't okay and in 10 years you're gonna notice that that other person's skin is going to start looking rough and leathery okay and it's going to really be hard and brittle okay because that's how it works add on top of that the fact that yes there are some of those harmful gamma and x-rays that are coming through and hitting us okay now we know that in some people okay that when we talk about um, like atomic energy let's let's talk about that for just one second okay because there were there were people that reported that when they watched the um, the bombs and the bikini atolls okay they put their hands over their face like this to cover their eyes and they said that you could literally see the bones in your skin okay because of the amount of light and x-ray radiation emitted by the atomic explosions okay now I'm not saying that you're gonna be able to go outside and you know like put your hand over and look at the Sun and go oh yeah I can see my skeleton that's not gonna happen okay but there are some x-rays that are coming down and hitting your skin this is also causing the breakdown of your elastin okay and we know this because we've studied the effects of radiation damage caused on human beings how do we know this well number one we studied a lot of Hiroshima and Nagasaki okay 
We studied the original explosions. We studied the after effects, the cancer, the breakdown of cells. We found that, people's, that people that suffered severe radiation poisoning, that their skin literally started to bubble and melt because the elastin in their, the protein, the elastin protein in their skin literally started to like liquefy, okay? And so doesn't it follow that I might not be uh, receiving as much radiation as an atomic bomb or an explosion, but, or standing next to say the elephant's foot in Chernobyl, but I am getting x-ray exposure from the sun. It is happening. Whether or not you want to admit it, that's up to you. But we know that it's happening, and it's actually caused. It's actually one of the main causes of aging. So, you say you're Psy Man Dan, yet you're not even following science. Does anybody else see this as the most ironic thing ever? I mean, come on. I can't be the only one that sees this as ironic. Okay? That the guy who calls himself Psy Man Dan doesn't even know that water vapor blocks x-rays, most of the x-rays, that Kent was talking about ice, not water vapor, and that the sun causes aging, is the leading cause of aging. Come on on dude ah uh, i just it blows my mind it really really does so i'm gonna end it here because i've been talking for over an hour now um i've been kind of keeping an eye on the time and i've i've gone way online way longer than i probably should have but i needed to get this point across because i think that it is asinine that people like simon dan think that we're the ones causing problems within the scientific community when they're the ones that can't even science and yet we're the ones that deny science i'm sorry did i miss something i can't be the only one that thinks this drop a comment smash that like button hit subscribe this has been russ's movie corner i'm russ and stay tuned for the second part where we will finish up. I know Kent's got kind of a derpy face right here, but we'll finish this up, and we're gonna we're gonna get into where he talks about the giants, and um, I'll I'll talk some more about how Simon Dan doesn't answer questions. Okay, so thank you for watching, and have a blessed day.